What's up, YouTube? This is Mathos987, and welcome back to Behind the Universe Pay-Per-View Breakdown. This time, we are covering the second WrestleMania in Universe Mode, the WWE 2K17 WrestleMania Pay-Per-View. But before we actually get into the editing file, let's just take a look here. 108 gigabytes of footage accumulated over the course of recording. Almost 17 hours. 17 hours of video that went into this almost six hour show. I like to, uh, per, I've been referring to this in my head as like a one man rest or a one man FAM show. Now I'm giving myself way too much credit there because my audio editing is not nearly as complex as anything that FAM does, but I mean, right here we've got what, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. 13 different recordings here. This one has a little bit of the Slammy Awards in it, to be fair. But yeah, 13 different recording sessions. Some of this, you can see the, with how I've titled it. Actually, this one is just a little throwaway clip. I actually, I want to give a shout out to Mr. Big Show Off because he gave me that clip because the stupid, the stupid clip that I needed. Um, in the actual game, the console version, it's the World Heavyweight title that that cutscene has, and you can't change the titles, so thanks to some PC modding goodness, Mr. Big Show Off was able to record this cutscene for me because I wasn't using any custom attires, so he just swapped the World Heavyweight title for the WWE Championship, so that way I was actually able to use that cutscene and WrestleMania, so thanks Mr. Big Show Off for that. If you're watching this video, that was really helpful. So, other than that, so I guess technically 12 big recording sessions. Some of this you can see I was able to do two matches in one. But then you had stuff like the ladder match, the Iron Man match, where there are just several files dedicated exclusively to that. It was not pretty. Not pretty, the recording process for this one. And just look at this timeline. I mean, almost six hours here. There's a lot going on in this timeline. Now, for the Royal Rumble video, I was very unorganized with how I structure the video. So this time, I'm just going to kind of gloss over everything. Last time, I wasn't entirely sure if I wanted to be tutorial styled or if I wanted to just show what I had done. This time, I'm just going to go through and show you guys everything that I did. So of course, here you can see is the mini little intro that I cooked up. It's really simple. If you've watched my promo video, my Behind the Universe on how I make my promos, you can kind of get the insight on is they're very basic effects that I used here. I was originally going to make a full promo for this. I just did not have the time. I did not have the time to fully flesh that out. So I decided, you know what, we'll just throw something together really quick, 20 seconds or so. Looks okay. I mean, nobody's really going to knock you for the intro because it's just an intro. People will be like, oh man, the song, if it's a hyped song, then we're good to go. So really, I didn't need to make a full-scale like AMV-styled promo as the opening, so I did not make one. Um, and then I'm gonna scroll down a little bit here because you can see I did have the audio. I moved it to a separate track so it could I could throw in the reverb so it sounded like it was coming from the arena. So we threw in the arena effect there, so it kind of just faded through between there so that was able to make a clean transition and then we jump into the commentary. So as you can see, I've got everything markered here. Um, so that way, I mainly did that so that when I was looking for the timestamps to put in the description, I have them there. Plus with the way that I always render everything out in a pre-commentary file, so I can just play back the video in Windows Media Player and I can just do the commentary on Audacity. I could probably try to record commentary through Sony Vegas or just display it in Sony Vegas but I'm always worried about the potential for there being lag and it screwing up the audio file because if you've been with my channel for, it, even last year I was having the issue. Like up until I got my new laptop in, I think it was like June or July. Uh, no, it would have been July because it was just after Survivor Series when I finally kicked the issue. So yeah, just after Survivor Series is when I got this laptop that I'm recording this on. And yeah, everything before that, the audio would always goof up. You can go back to almost any video before July. I won't, not every video was like that, but even like the first Behind the Universe script recording, because I think I recorded that while Survivor Series was rendering. So even that had a little bit of an audio skip to it. So you can go back to any of those old videos, really, 
and the audio gets all messed up. So I'm I'm deathly afraid of that happening during a commentary like this, especially now. Uh, so that's why I just render it out as a separate video file. I'll delete it later because I don't actually edit it. Before, I used to edit my pre-commentary files. Like, I'd throw them in and re-render the footage, and that ruins the quality of it. So usually I'll just render those out. I'll export those. You know, maybe if you're like an Apple user, I forget. I don't know exactly how the terms balance out. It's render, export, they're the same thing. So that is what I used to do. That's what I do now. So it does take up some memory space to export those, but it's a simple fix because I, then I can just delete them after I've recorded all the commentaries. Speaking of commentary, at the time I'm recording this video, I have not finished commentary for it, but I have the rest of this week that I can do that yet. This video I kind of just want to get done before I forget about it because I have some more scripted stuff I want to work on. So here you can see with this opening triple threat match, we open with a standard triple threat, then there's a bit of a cutaway here. I was really happy with how this one turned out because usually I would do a crowd cutaway here to jump between match footage. But with this one, I was able to just seamlessly make a frame-by-frame -frame cut. Thankfully, I mean, the referee is not in perfect position because the, the darn ref always ruins my shots so many times. I'll try to make a clean cut in even just a regular match. The freaking referee. He's always in a different position. He'll be here, and then the next clip he's here. And then I can't make the cut, and I have to find a... I have to do weird zooms, or um, I have to do crowd cutaways. So there were a couple instances in this match where I was able to make the clean cuts. So right here, um, you've got Sasha Banks versus Natalia. This is a separate singles match, separate from the triple threat that included all three. Then Sasha gets knocked out of the action. Asuka comes in. That one I had to do a cutaway because I, there was no clean transition there. So then we have a separate singles match here. So already we've got three matches going into just this one match alone. Usually, this, so with the way that I did recording for this, uh, certain matches, like with the Royal Rumble, I had to do several sessions for just one match. In some of these, like this matchup, I did everything in just one continuous like stream. This one, we were ac actually able to make a fairly clean cutaway. I mean, the submission bar changes, but that's not a big deal. I, I'm not too picky about that. But there are other... There are other things like with the Iron Man match, for example, or the ladder match, when we when we cover those, those I had to record in completely separate sessions. So I would record some of it, edit it together, and then figure out what I needed. So then we have another match, this one Sasha Banks versus Asuka, and that continues on for the rest until the finish. Obviously, if you haven't already seen WrestleMania, you should check that out because this is going to have spoilers. You've been warned. Okay, there's your spoiler. So yeah, I think that was, what, four, five matches? We had the Triple Threat, Natalia, Sasha Banks, Asuka, Natalia. No, just four. Um, yeah, so there was... Actually, no, there was another Triple Threat mixed in there. So it could have even been five. I'm not entirely sure. Sometimes I'm able to figure out when I want the transitions to be. So no, I don't think there's any way that that Triple Threat clip was... No, because I would have recorded that after we got to this point. Um, yeah, because I usually find a point that I can cut back to, so this one I knew I was going to cut back to the Asuka lock, because I needed Sasha Banks to break that up. So, we only had, we had the five matches there, because I had to do the triple threat twice. So then we cut ahead, we have a bit of a, a bit of a shout out here to one of my, one of my followers, um, his name is leaving me at the moment, but I know him on Twitter, I follow him on Twitter. And I've seen his channel. I promoted him. And I can't remember his name. I apologize. Uh, shoot. It'll come to me later on. But, um, yeah. I, I like to throw in these little ad spots when I can. Just because it, uh, it, breaks, it breaks away the action. So, I could throw in an ad break. Which is what I did for the rest. But if I can promote another channel. And kind of throw in this little ad spot. Now, obviously, don't send me stuff. I will seek you out if I want to promote your content um, because I'm not going to just promote anybody. Like Your content has to be something that actually sort of stands out to me, something that I am willing to promote. So don't ask me, hey, can you, can you put me in the next show? No, the answer is always no. If I don't come to you, you're not getting put in the show. So please do not ask. 
So this spot was fairly interesting. Um, there's not really too much complex going on here. We had Axel make his entrance to the ring. This is Baron Corbin's no-show, so what I did, I took a couple of clips from the highlight reel. Uh, these are... Uh, they're like the entrance promos. Let me restore this real quick. Cutscene. It doesn't show me where they actually came from, and I'm too lazy to actually go in and stretch out the footage. Um, but they were from, I think, it was like the enter, you know, those those promos where it's like enter someone, and then it's a cutaway to the screen, and then I guess after that is when you would have to throw in the person coming down to the ring. So that's what I did here. There's a bit of a reaction here from Axel. So it's like the call out, uh, the call out sequence that is sitting here. So that's what I used here, just a couple of shots. So that way I'm not always cutting to the crowd. I figured we'd spice it up a little because everybody's waiting for Corbin's entrance. Everyone's staring at the stage. So let's throw in a couple shots of the stage. And then we had a couple of different cutaways to Axel. There's a shot now. A couple of crowd cutaways so he would have time to change into his entrance attire. Or not his entrance attire. Change out of his entrance attire into his ring gear. So that way when we made it to the 10 count, Axel, it wasn't just he was suddenly dressed in his entrance attire and realistically if i had been thinking i should have just kept him in his entrance attire um but you know i guess he's frustrated so he threw off his clothes i guess that makes sense yeah in professional wrestling it makes sense so yeah axel that's all that really went down there not too much um obviously we have his victory music and then just i had to be careful with how i cut the victory scene as well because you don't want to show him celebrating because he wasn't happy that he won by a forfeit, so if I show him celebrating, that's counterintuitive. So I decided to just take sort of a select cut of it, where he looks kind of disappointed. He's like, what do I do? So that's what we did there. Moving ahead now to the tag team matchup. This is where things get tricky. Yeah, the triple threat, we had to splice together five different matches. I don't even know how many was involved in this one. This one had to have taken multiple different recording files. There I see the the Iron Man stuff, the ladder stuff. There's my commentary. I do not see the tag stuff. I don't know where it is in here, so I'm not going to search for it. But yeah, there's obviously we had the there's the original match where the Dudleys and Balor and Itami make their entrances intercut with a one-on-one -on -one backstage brawl between Victor and Darren Young, a one-on-one -on -one brawl between Connor and Titus O'Neil, and then at that point it, essentially, I'm just doing things backstage in the backstage brawl to try to fill time. Um, not really to fill time, but like advance the match as well, and actually make it look like there's a convincing brawl going on. But I don't know exactly how I'm going to cut the footage when I'm recording it, so I just record a bunch of stuff. If I flub something, if I flub a spot, well then that's when I decide, okay, I just have to remember that I'm cutting that part out. Um, usually what I'll do is I'll like pause the footage so that's kind of my cue is hey this is a spot that you have to cut out because obviously I'm not going to leave the selection screen in the footage so that's my cue that uh, something needs to be changed so we kind of cut back and forth between the Titus Connor Darren Victor and Dudley's versus the tag champs matches so we had a bit of a zoom in here to kind of cut Hideo Itami from the from the shot so it looks like he's not there because obviously He's just going to be standing outside of the ring. And how am I supposed to say, oh, it's a two-on-one assault on Finn Balor. Hideo Itami can't help him when Hideo Itami is standing right outside the ring, not doing anything. Not very convincing, so we have to cut him out of the shot. So that's what we did there. Then Itami gets back in, knocks back down. Then we cut back to Victor Darren Young, cut back to Connor and Titus, because there's probably a couple of botches in between, so this is my way of cutting around it. And then... See, the stupid thing here, I think in the background, I can't tell, I believe that might actually be, I can't tell if it's Chris Jericho or Finn Balor. That was something that I didn't notice until I got to the editing phase, and I was not about to re-record it, so I just kind of ignored it. Uh, for the most part, Darren Young kind of blocks it, and it's really difficult to see. Like, if you super zoom in, well, you know what, let's, let's just do it. Let's just do it for fun. That is Finn Balor. Crap. Well, you can't be perfect with everything. That's Chris Jericho. That's not Finn Balor. I don't know what you're talking about. The evidence lies. Did you know that the camera adds 10 pounds? It also changes your identity completely. Yeah, because Finn Balor's here in the ring, so that, that couldn't have been Finn Balor. 
There's no way. I'm just making things up now. So then, of course, we have to cut Itami back into the ring. Just fairly different stuff here. I went over most of this. I probably went over in my Behind the Universe. Uh, not that. Uh, I went over in my Royal Rumble video. So now you see we had to cut away, give enough time for Victor and Darren Young to make it out to the stage. Later on, we're going to see Titus and Connor make it to the stage. So basically, this matchup at this point is just cutting back and forth between... Actually, the only problem here was that with this sort of backstage brawl, I don't think there's any real way to get back there in the WrestleMania arena. I had to do this in the Raw arena because I had to do straight up backstage brawl because WrestleMania, I couldn't figure out how to make it backstage through the stage. I'm actually not even sure if you can do that. I might have just not been paying full attention, though, because obviously I have my controls disabled, so I can't tell when it's prompting me to go back there. And I might have just had the wrong match selected, possibly. Either way, those are two... Um, the cutaway here with Victor and Darren, this is a separate match entirely from their backstage brawl. So that's already two matches just for these guys alone. And then Connor and Titus have one, so that right there is already four matches. Uh, we had some singles action between Devon and Finn Balor. So that right there on top of the tag team match. We're up to now six different matches intercut in this one. Then we've got Diva or Bubba Ray versus Hideo one-on-one. -on -one. So that's seven matches just for the sake of this one match. And at this point, it's just a mix of cutting back and forth until something eventually happens. So then we have Balor jump into the ring. Oh, actually, no, we had... That gets delivered. This is where I use some of the highlight reel. Part of this I took inspiration from. Uh, actually, I, I don't think I took inspiration. No, yes, I did. I believe Delzinski's Judgment Day pay-per-view. I had already seen it by the time I started working on this. Because um, Delzinski did something similar to this in his Fatal 4-Way. And I thought, oh, that'd be cool to use. And there was no real creative way other than the highlight reel to cut this together. It still bothers me that you can't get rid of this stupid display at the bottom of the screen, so I have to do a super huge cut on it. So it, I mean, like this, we're cutting, like this is a terrible camera angle, but I can't zoom the footage any further because then I get the, the selection bar. So this is a couple different camera angles. I could have done it all at one, but I'm trying to give the illusion that, um, cause technically, this was the point where the Ascension is making their way down to the ring. So I have to cut it in a way that doesn't show the, the stage. Like here, it doesn't show enough of the entrance ramp. Like they could be right on the other side of that screen. It's all just a matter of trying to maintain that kayfabe. Just don't do anything that would break the illusion. So like the moment Hideo gets knocked out, I obviously can't cut to any other part of this ring because here you could see right behind there is where Devon would be. So this camera shot is okay. But if I got like an overhead shot of Balor rushing the ring, it would have to be incredibly, like an incredibly close shot. Otherwise, you're going to see that Devon's not there and it just breaks the immersion. So then we cut in. This wasn't exactly the cleanest edit, but you kind of do what you can. I just realized that, well, you know what, Devon, he's hiding under this part of the apron. So it kind of, kind of works. And it's a quick enough cut where then we then we see Bubba Ray making his fall out of the ring. Hideo Itami, it's just barely to the point where he would not be on screen, so it works. And then I had to make sure that I cut Victor in here. It, you see, a lot of this, it's really difficult to cut this all together to make it convincingly work, uh, because I guess technically right there is where Bubba Ray would be, so it's not 100% perfect, but if the, if the highlight reel were better like this, is a very bad camera shot, but there's nothing really I can do. That's the limitations of the game for you. But I do what I can. I try to work whatever magic I can. So we had another singles match between Balor and Bubba Ray in this cutaway where Balor comes in and knocks him out of the ring. Then, of course, we have, I believe what is now, our that's our eighth, or was it our ninth matchup? No, Bubba Finn was the eighth. This is the ninth cutaway as now we have a singles... Well, technically, this is not a singles match, even. Because, because Connor is right there. I was supposed to actually cut him out of the final version. So, thank goodness I'm recording this before actually uh, releasing WrestleMania, so I can fix that. Um, yeah, because I can just make a quick little adjustment to show that he's not there. I didn't even notice he was there. So, yeah, Connor is not in this shot, so I'll have to fix this 
as much as I can. The footage is going to look really stretched, but there's limitations of the game I have to work with. So this is our ninth matchup. It's a triple threat now, featuring the Ascension and Finn Balor. Now we can cut back to regular footage. This is still from the Connor, uh, the Connor Titus O'Neil thing. Connor's obviously way off screen here. If I were to zoom out that shot, you can see he's he's standing right there by the the big. Well, that's like middle in the shot, so he's a little past the play button. I just had to focus it on Titus, and I do the same later on with Darren Young. So what I was able to do in this matchup that I was really happy with is instead of using crowd cutaways, I could cut to the other superstars, which I was really happy with. It was able to break away, so it's not just showing the same crowd cutaways all the time, because the game only gives you so many to work with. Um, but there you see there's the elimination, the ascension. This is actually another separate match. I had to make it a handicap matchup so we could actually hit the fall of man, because it's a tag team finisher, you can't hit it otherwise. So that's now 10 matches for the sake of this one match. So Finn Balor gets eliminated. Then we have to have Connor. Well, there's a bit of a celebration just to give it a little bit of breathing room to the action so we're not just cutting straight from shot to shot. This is a now the 11th match as it's a singles between Connor and Darren Young as he goes out there. Connor had to be away from the ring so I could set up the 3D. This is 12 matches. So we have a handicap between the Dudleys and Victor. That eliminates the Ascension. We get their celebration. We cut back to this matchup. Darren runs to the ring. Used a bit of the highlight reel here again. So that way we could cut to now what would be match number 13, a triple threat between the Dudleys and Darren Young. This goes on for a while. Match number 14, I had to have Victor throw Titus closer to the ring. We're back again to this triple threat. This goes on for a while. And then after this breaks off, Devon... I got really lucky with how this shot played out because Devon happened to start rolling the the automatic you know ring escape that triggers during a triple threat or just a multi-man match just as I happened to clothesline Bubba Ray over the top rope so that worked out really well otherwise I would have had to splice it together with a crowd cutaway but here I was able to just zoom in on these two guys and exclude Devon from the shot entirely which allowed me to cut to match number 14 Titus versus Devon and then I can just cut back and forth between that and the 15th match, Bubba Ray versus Darren Young. This goes on for a little while. Titus throws Darren into the or Devon into the ring. Darren enters the ring. This would now be the 16th match. And this other cutaway that I use here, I made sure to record that in the other matchup because uh, I wanted to show like you know Bubba getting knocked out by drive by kick. Could have worked, but I wanted to draw out the tension a bit more, so we had another cutaway there. We cut back in, and that leads to the finish of the match. Now, obviously, I had to do another match on top of that so I could get the victory celebration where the primetime players are winning the tag team titles. So that's 17 matches for this one tag team matchup. That is... That's only just the beginning, folks. This is only, what, the third matchup. Well, technically... I mean, technically, yeah, it's the second, because this matchup never really became a match, but it's the third match, because I had to put in work on that. This one, we finally get to a bit of simplicity. This one's just a straight-up singles match. Most of this I was able to do, not necessarily in one take. There obviously are some crowd cutaways. I had to um, cut things together here. We were able to throw in. What I like doing with this pay-per-view, what I like to do for pay-per-views just in general now is use the, whether it's the highlight reel like it is here, to spice up the shots. The only problem is that the footage is in slow motion. So I had to mess with the speed a little bit so that it, the audio in the background would match in time with the strike. Uh, but what I what I like to do is now use the replay footage. Because um, I'll usually make up my own replays at the end. But just to add a different camera perspective, use the, the replay footage. So I'll... I'll enable post-match replays for the pay-per-views because I use replays anyway, so I need extended versions of the theme songs to have the time to throw it in there. But with regular shows, I don't use the extra camera cutaways because I don't use replays in my regular shows. So it's a bit of... I tried to just go the extra mile with this show. It, just with pay-per-views in general, that's what I try to do now. Um, that's going to become my new standard. Here, that's a bit of a rough cut, 
Um, obviously, I had to make an edit there. It's not perfect, but you can't get the crowd to do what you want all the time, so it's just a sacrifice that I have to make. I wouldn't have had to go so extreme if the referee wasn't messing up my shot. In one shot, he's here. The next shot, he's here. I hate this ref, but that wasn't even... That, that happens all the time. So I could either crowd cut away there, which I try not to abuse anymore. I hate using crowd cutaways now. The WWE themselves does that now, but it, 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 it actually aggravates me because they're not editing video game footage. Why? They do crowd cutaways, I guess, to show surprise reactions of the fans and make the fans feel involved when it's blatantly cutting away from the action. You could miss an important story beat there, some sort of like character moment. You know, even just the expression of shock on a superstar's face. I'm more invested in the superstars than the people watching in the stands. So when you cut away to a, a shocked crowd reaction, I don't care. They're not part of the match. You're taking me out of the action. Which is why now I try to avoid using cutaways at all costs, which is why I'll use the highlight reel. I'll use the post-match replays to try to bridge the gap, or I'll just uh, zoom in. Like in an instance here, I zoomed in for dramatic effect to keep the submission bar out of the screen. I did that several times in this video. It's not, don't expect it to be a regular thing because it's a very tedious process cropping out the pin and submission bars, and it's very annoying. Um, I mean, I'm okay with doing it for pay-per-views, especially this WrestleMania, because I really wanted to draw out the tension behind each pinfall. So it might be something that I pull out for pay-per-views. But if I start doing all of these... Com I'm not going to say complex edits, because they're not really complex. But if I start doing all of this extra stuff on my regular videos, then I, I do value quality, but I also value consistency. Um, because of how long it already takes me to work at the schedule I have now, the last thing I want to do is delay that even further, because I've been doing this for four years, and I this is my second WrestleMania, so I'm only just now reaching two full years in universe mode. I would like to be quicker about it, but, you know, obviously the production time does take time. Here you can see it's a crowd cutaway, because I had no other way to... If I have to use a crowd cutaway, I will, because otherwise I'm jump cutting, and that looks like garbage. So, I use crowd, crowd cutaways as an absolute last resort now. I used to abuse it. Like, when I first started using them back at Money in the Bank, that was all I did was crowd cutaways. But, yeah, I did try to cut out the, the pin bars. I didn't do... It was something that I kind of decided partway through, because... A lot of the earlier stuff, like this matchup, the the tag team matchup, the triple threat, a lot of the earlier matches don't have the cutaways like that, because it was something I decided to start doing later on into the show, so I kind of went back, and for the more dramatic moments, like in this one, um, when people were hitting finishers, I'd use it, but when it got towards the main event, I was using it almost constantly, because... I would like with I know with the main event there was this one move in particular where I was like okay once that move happens on commentary I'm gonna sell that like it could potentially be the finish so I'm gonna cut that out uh, I'm gonna cut the pin bar out so that way it really seems like it could be the end of the match even though it obviously wasn't going to be uh, but that's my goal on commentaries to try to try to sell that a lot of these are just the standard cut in or cut back I I do a mix of zooms and straight cuts for whatever meets the situation. Here I had to make a... When people put up crowd signs as well, that bothers me because I can't control that and sometimes that messes up my shot. So like this one, I had to I had to hold the shot a bit longer than I wanted to so that way the guy would put down his sign and I could just make the clean jump to this next shot. But yeah, most of this was... When I say one take, I mean like it was all done in one continuous session. Um... I did probably botch a couple of pin, uh, a couple of kickouts, which tends to happen in these matches. That is both bad and good. It's bad in that I obviously have to start another match, so it adds an extra take. But uh, it's good because then I get the replays. So sometimes I'll intentionally get pinned off of something that I'm not going to showcase because I want the extra crowd shut or the crowd cutaways. So there's a moment I believe right here. 
Now, this is the highlight reel again. I don't think this matchup actually had any strong cutaways. Um, I mo use mostly the highlight reel for this matchup. But in other matches, like the Punk Brian one, most of the, the later stuff, I used a lot of the highlight reel cuts just to add different camera angles, just to spice things up, keep people interested. But the singles matchups like this, these are... These are really easy to put together. Like, yeah, I might botch a couple kickouts and I have to edit in the spots, or I might botch a move and I have to go back to replace it. Uh, sometimes I also run into the issue where I just can't click with the two superstars. I don't... That didn't happen in this in this show, particularly. I apologize for that. I might actually not even have the background audio that I'm using right now, but I just accidentally bumped a key and I hit the zero insert key, you know, the little number pad. I hate when I hit that. I'm aiming for the arrows, and then it gives me this stupid little render region, so then I have to fix that when I actually want to render something. Otherwise, it's stuck in the loop. But that's just sort of the tedious process of editing. Obviously, then you see certain guys like Cody Rhodes, Evolution, CM Punk I have to throw in their, their theme song, so I'll put that down here in a separate track. It has a, a reverb effect on it, so it sounds like it's in the arena. Most of the in-game audio, though, I use for the entrance music. Uh, this ladder matchup, this one was, this was actually the last match that I completed recording of. Um, I had started recording it. It wasn't the last one that I started recording. The last thing that I actually started recording was the main event. But because it was a singles match, I was able to just run it all through in one continuous session. How long did that one actually take me? Because that matchup ended up being almost like 40 minutes, I think, in, in its entirety. Uh, where is it? Where is it? There's the Iron Man finale. Uh, I'm blind. Main event. I can't remember how I labeled it. There it is. WrestleMania main event. That one was an hour 48 minutes to put together that, like, 30-something minute match. This one, the CM Punk Daniel Bryan, you can see that's even shorter than this one. This one actually worked out really well. Most of that, uh, it all just clicked with me, and I was just able to throw it all together in one. So I was happy with that. Something like this ladder match, this was one of the more tedious ones. The tag team match was a big one. The ladder match here, obviously we start out with the standard six-man match. Everything breaks off. There's no way I can edit a, a match like this with all six people on screen. It's not going to be... Uh, up to my quality because a lot of the AI is just going to be derping and it's going to look like garbage and I could do a bunch of zoom cuts and just zoom to different parts of the arena but I, I like having control of the whole thing because I can control what's going on and it, I think that better controls the pacing of it all so I don't have to worry about uh, visually making everything look like garbage because this doesn't even look that great uh, having to zoom in so far on this shot, because I'm cutting out the ring, the top, I'm cutting most of this out, because obviously that's going to stretch the footage, but I can't be showing any of this, because that's where the other superstars are, so I have to, I have to cut off as much as I can, but doing that for a six-man match would be, I mean, even worse, because like here, I can at least cut away where I can have both people on screen in a normal shot, I did have to make a few adjustments, um, I did have to make a few adjustments, like right here, cut out most of that, so you could believe that Jericho and Miz were elsewhere. And then, of course, he does the suicide dive through the rope. A lot of this is just, again, quick shot, so I'm not too worried about trying to fix it. But yeah, most of that I have to cut out. And if I did that for having all six people on screen, it would just look like garbage. So obviously here we had the six-man ladder match. We have Ares, Rhodes, they broke off. So that's two matches. You have Cruz and Breeze. You have Miz and Jericho. This goes on for a bit. Once I cut all that footage together, then we jump into Breeze and Jericho in the ring. I have to make sure that I'm keeping track of everything. So a matchup like this, I had a text document where I I actually did plan out a few spots for this pay-per-view. Uh, mostly the finishes for some of the things. But this matchup and the Iron Man match in particular, um, and I guess the tag team matchup as well, I did plan some stuff out. Uh, the tag team matchup might not have been in writing. It was all stuff that I just knew. I want to do this. I want this to happen here. And then I just put it all together. So this one, I actually had everything planned out. I knew, okay, we're going to cut to Breeze. He's going to be in the ring. Jericho's going to come in. They're going to scuffle for a bit. And then Jericho's going to get knocked out. 
And then from a different part of the area, Cody Rhodes sneaks in. That's the thing. I like to have people. So like Jericho got knocked to the right. So I'll have someone come in from the left or maybe the top. And then if someone gets knocked to the bottom, then they come from, you know, they're not going to come from the same place because then you'd be like, where is the other guy? He just got knocked out that way. So we're up to about six matches so far into this one matchup. We have a bit of a scuffle between Breeze and Rhodes. Again, throwing a bit of a zoom so that way I can cut straight to this next shot of Miz rushing the ring. Like I said, I try to avoid crowd cutaways whenever I can because otherwise you're seeing the same thing over and over again. This matchup already, I had to use it a lot. So maybe a bit, a bit, maybe some jankier edits here with the zooming and whatnot, but it's either that or use these this same crowd cutaway like five times and do that with every other thing. So just trying to mix up the visual somewhat. Again, limitations of a game. There is stuff that you have to work with. So we've got this little scuffle between Breeze and Miz. In comes Austin Aries. They go at it for a while. We, we cut away to action on the outside because there were a couple of botches in the ring between Aries and Breeze. So I cut to Jericho and Cruz to serve as a natural breaking point there. We cut back to Aries and Breeze. And then we cut back to Cruz and Jericho. This gives me time to, again, edit out the botches. And there were certain, I mean, there was botches between Cruz and Jericho as well that I had to cut out. So I'm able to dump Breeze outside of the ring and instead of cutting to the crowd, I can cut away to this, where Jericho lays out Cruz with a code breaker. Ares, meanwhile, can climb the ladder, and then Jericho rushes in. And then that goes on for quite a while. Ares gets to... This is where, if you have a ladder match, you always have to... Almost always have to have that standard spot fest, where somebody just goes off, and they hit their finishers. Uh, you, could do it, you could do it with a guy like Cesaro, where he delivers a bunch of uppercuts... You could do super kicks, code breakers, spears. Big show, you could probably do knockout punches. Choke slams, maybe, but they're a bit slower. Um, you know, just basically those catching finishers. It doesn't have to be necessarily a catching finisher, but it helps because you have more, you can hit them from more diverse positions. So, code breaker was my move in this one. So, we had Jericho lay out Cruz on the outside. Ares from the top rope, he gets nailed with a code breaker. Rhodes does a springboard. He gets caught with a code breaker. Code breaker was also a ladder move. So I was really happy when I could do this spot between Miz and Jericho, where Jericho hits a code breaker atop the ladder. And I like how the finishers work this time around, because if you hit a finisher, they don't just get up right away. Like, one of the things I hated was the old neck breaker animation in particular, because the way that you fall, both both guys are essentially landing like straight on the canvas. Like both their heads are bouncing off the canvas, but the guy who initiates the move just stands straight up. Um, even last year, like I cut away to something and I think I brought in other superstars to the ring for it so I could get Cesaro out of the ring when he, when he hit it on Corey Graves. Uh, I don't remember exactly how I handled that, but it's it's just not natural. You take a fall from the ladder like that, you're not going to get up. So fortunately, he stayed down uh, because of the new the new animations. It actually keeps him down longer. So I was able to believably have them roll out of the ring. Showing the replay buys me a bit of time here. I didn't do that any other time in this pay-per-view. Show replays like mid-match. I used to do that, but I don't do that as much anymore because I don't really like to cut away from the action that much, but it's something I could do for high-profile matchups like this, something I'll have to consider in the, in the future. But this, this pay-per-view took long enough to produce as is, so I just kind of wanted to get it done. I mean, I already did a, a bunch of stuff with this anyway. It wasn't even actually something that I considered doing for any other match. I just did it here to give me some extra breathing room rather than cut away for crowds. And I mean, hey, it's a code breaker from the top of the ladder. If that doesn't deserve a mid-match replay, I don't know what does. Then we cut away again. This is Cruz and Breeze this time. We're at something like 12 different matches, boiling down to this one thing. This is a separate cutaway. Oh, Apollo Cruz is actually in that shot, so I'm going to have to fix that as well. I did not even notice that. See, there's certain things, like he's barely on the screen. I don't think most people would notice that. But the fact that anybody could notice it is a problem, so I have to cut that out. Uh, you know what? I'm going to put a marker here because I'm going to forget to cut that out otherwise. So I'll just put that there. And leaving it unlabeled, I'll know what it is. 
So this is obviously a separate match. Cruz is standing there. You can, I think, yeah, this is a singles match between Ares and Cruz. So Ares pulls out the ladder. Now for every preceding shot, for every, or er, proceeding, every following shot that comes after this, I had to pull that ladder out from under the ring for each shot. So this there, I had to get it again. Uh, I would have, I think for the most part, like, you know, you have Cruz or Breeze pull out the ladder. So I had to grab it for this shot. I had to grab it again for this shot. Yeah, every preceding shot where you see the ladder draped across the, the barricade and the apron, you have to grab it from under the ring each time because otherwise it's not there. Also, the tricky thing this time around with the new ladder mechanics is setting up the ladder in the same position that it was before because the way you try to position it, it doesn't always angle correctly because of the way that the, the new ladder mechanics work. That was kind of fun to figure out. The one thing I did not like, though, was this stupid wheelhouse. Like, for an actual match, it's more competitive, and I like that, but it's not really good for presentation. I tried to cut it out wherever I could, but, I mean, look at that. That thing is just obtrusive. I, like, if I tried to cut that, we'd get a horrible camera angle, so I had to sort of compromise. Some shots, I could get rid of it. Some, I couldn't. It's just certain things that you have to get used to over time. If the highlight reel were better, I could maybe try to piece that together with a different a different camera angle. But again, with different camera angles, everybody's outside of the ring. I can, I'm can i limited with my uh, angle selections there as well. So it's just a lot of things to consider when you're making a thing like this. This match and the tag team matchup were obviously the most difficult matches to produce. The Iron Man match was far less complicated by comparison because it was essentially two one-on-one -on -one matches. And I did have a couple... I did have the cutaway with Blake and Murphy and the Revival, but that was it. Um, so everything else for that was basically standard singles fare. This, I always have to worry about the other four people who aren't on screen. So Breeze gets taken out. Again, had to set up that ladder. Uh, we have another new match with Rhodes and Aries. This goes on for a little bit. I believe it is Miz who comes into the ring. Another thing that they changed is this stupid thing. You can't just go over and push down the ladder. You have to mash the button. So what I did here, because it took longer than it should have, like I wanted him to just come in and shove down the ladder. So we did this cheeky little zoom. So it doesn't just look like a straight jump cut. It's not the cleanest edit, but this game, it... it it, er, things that I wasn't expecting because I had never done a ladder match before this actually that was my first mistake so when I actually when I was recording this the first time I went to grab the title I think it was Jericho who went for the title the stupid pop-up came up like as I was recording it so that's why I had to make a weird edit I think it happened here too because that was the first time I try I tried to knock the ladder over and I was like oh crap it will not let me do this so I had to, I think that was why I did the zoom was because it stopped me and the audio just dies. You can see the audio fade here because at some point it just dies off because it gave me the pop-up. So I had to, that's the thing also with editing audio, just make sure that there aren't, there isn't any dead air. Um, you just have to sort of fade it. It's not too difficult. If I wanted to be like FAM and make everything flow together nicely, I'd bring in my own different external crowd noise so I could bring in my own boo and cheers but maybe someday maybe someday if I had a second person helping me work on this but it it took me like a month just to get this Wrestlemania done the way as it is if I wanted to also throw in all the all the fancy audio edits to it as well ugh, it really does bother me that the promos don't have sound to it because that's probably where like, when, with chair shots, you can't hear anything. So I might have to start using audio effects there. I was meaning to do that earlier, but I just haven't even looked at the file. Uh, the, the file of audio effects that I have, which I need to do. So I can start using those. Maybe at some point I'll get to it. We cut away to another match. I've stopped keeping track. You can keep track in your head um, on how many different matches are going into this. Because there's a lot. And it would just be repetitive at this point, I think, of me to continuously bring them up so there i believe this whole thing with cruise and breeze was w just one match i did 
uh, make the cutaway here to Jericho. Again, just do some cheeky zooms so that way I can make the straight cut, not have to worry about a crowd cutaway. We have the, and then I, I also have to be careful that the ladder's in the corner here. So again, it's all just about paying attention to the details. Make sure that you know where everything is. Um, especially like the referee, the referee is one of the easiest things to lose. That and a stupid person in the crowd putting up a sign. Uh, those are things I typically miss because I'm not laser focused on everything that's going on. But for the positioning of an object, I can usually keep track of that fairly well. So there we go ahead, put him through the ladder. Now I can finally stop pulling out that ladder for every single shot. And then again, it's just making sure the ladder's in the same position. And yeah, these guys, they battle it out for a while. Cruz knocks down Rhodes. Jericho comes in. They battle for a while. We come back with a top rope code breaker. I was glad that they added that animation to the game because it gave me one new way to hit the code breaker. And it was the last time I needed to hit a code breaker because then Jericho climbs the ladder. Rhodes comes back in. Jericho, see like here, I did a pretty good job at cutting it out. Unfortunately, when Jericho gets punched, because he leans, the the wheelhouse follows him. So there was really nothing I could do with that. Like otherwise, if I cut this any further, like they're barely in the shot as is. If I cut any further, I'm just looking straight at the crowd. So there was there was nothing I can do in this situation. Um, I mean, I guess theoretically I could have tried to use the highlight reel, but. You know, I, I have, I use Elgato's flashback recording feature where I can just have it, have the footage play and then up to two hours at least. And then I can just go back, drag the timeline all the way to the left, hit the record button and in one fell swoop it records the whole session. But I'm limited to two hours so I'm always watching my time whenever I'm making a video like this. Especially with a tedious process like the ladder match where I want to make sure that I have all the footage because if I lose part of the footage that throws everything out of whack because every single shot that follows that piece of footage needs that piece of footage so then I have to try to go back and figure out you know try to fill in the gaps and that that's really difficult here I had a post match replay that I was able to use so that was an instance where I didn't have to worry about the wheelhouse um, also because you have to go through it like six times to actually pull the title down that was a, a very time-consuming process, so this way we can speed it up. Rhodes just grabs the title and roll replays. And I thought I was really happy with how I was able to time this. Uh, first of all, uh, we go from the daytime after this match to evening, so I wanted to throw an ad spot in there anyway, and so I decided to throw in Heel Diggies, FNN, Friday Night Nexus. I just thought it was perfect because Diggy, uh, I had sort of consulted him about this the whole Stardust storyline, he was sort of in on it the whole time. Like, I pitched the idea to him, bounced ideas off of him. So, um, that, because, like, when I was first thinking of it, I was questioning whether or not I should even do it. There's, I'm going to make a video about this, uh, another Behind the Universe, that what could have happened, where I'll discuss it in more detail. But um, I thought it was really cool how we kind of had this full circle moment where this was the, the main storyline he was kind of invested in on my series. Um, because uh, the whole Rhodes, Ares, Jericho, Stardust thing. Um, so then throwing his ad there, it was just sort of a, a nice full circle moment uh, because Rhodes wins the title, and we cut to the ad. Now that gives me time to make the transition to, to evening less jarring. I think I did the same thing from evening to night. I threw in my little uh, my ad for my second channel there. It wasn't as time-consuming, so theoretically, I guess it's not perfect, but it's better than just, in this shot, it is daytime, and all of a sudden it's evening. How did we get there? So I did have to rework my ad breaks just to make sure that I got that to work. This matchup wasn't really anything special. You have your standard one-on-one -on -one between Paige and Stephanie. Then we need to cut to a triple threat match so that Nia Jax can get brought in. And then... Stephanie cuts to the outside, and then we just have a standard one-on-one -on -one between Paige and Nia Jax. That goes on. We cut back and forth between the triple threats and the singles matches because Steph comes back in. Nia Jax takes her down. We're back to the triple threat, and that really just finishes that match. Nothing too in-depth there. 
Then we have this tag team matchup. When I talk about things just not clicking, this was one of those matches. Tag team matches are always, 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 always a pain. Um, not just even just the normal tag teams where the tag team mechanics are garbage to begin with. But when you have multiple people on screen, it's really difficult to put everything together. That's why the Fatal 4-Way tag team matchup was such a hassle. The triple threat wasn't so bad. When it's just three people, that's a bit more manageable. But when you start getting up to four, uh, five, six, that's when it really starts to become difficult to handle. I could have tried to make this a tornado tag, but I felt like I had enough. Because, uh, like, I had already done the ladder match. I already did the tag team Fatal 4-Way tornado elimination thing. Plus the triple threat. We're going to have matches later on, like... Um, actually, no, that's basically it. But I felt like having a standard tag team match up here, I felt like it was needed because it we had so much chaos going on. Let's just have a regular tag team matchup in the show just so that way it's something different because when you... You have to have a little bit of normalcy because if you keep hitting someone with over-the-top things, that becomes the standard and then... If you cut to something normal, then it doesn't. You, you, it, like it, it just doesn't. It's not the same. The over-the-top stuff won't have as much impact as it would in just a standard video. So this way, it does kind of preserve that balance. I guess you could. The way that I look at this, I'm very happy with how I structured this card. Um, this was the point where my voice started to go, so I did eventually stop recording commentary here, and I came back earlier today to record this stuff. I have to finish the rest, obviously, later this week. But this was sort of the lull period. And I know you might say, well, that you know, why would you put in matches like that that aren't as high of a quality? It's because you do need a bit of a cool-down period. I'm not saying that these are piss-break matches. I don't think they were that abominable bad. I don't even think that they were bad. But, I mean, with everything else, you had... We were just balls to the wall from the beginning. Like the Intercontinental match, six guys in the ring at all times, uh, or around the ring at least. Tag team matchup, that was chaos. Reigns and John Cena, yeah, it was a standard singles match, but there was there were tons of false finishes. The women's triple threat, we needed a bit of a cool down here. So, because then we kick it back, we go back to Brock Shinsuke, and again, you know, you have the, a building of tension, up until Rhodes wins the title, you let that tension sort of fall down, give your audience a bit of a break, so that way, with Brock and Shinsuke, we start to build the tension back up. Brian and Punk, they tear it down. Sting Wyatt, it's a bit of a slower matchup, so again, you give the crowd a bit of a time to sort of recuperate. But at the same time, if I had put Paige and, you know, if I'd put these matches here, then you would have completely lost momentum between... Uh, the the Iron Man in this matchup, Bray Wyatt has been or Sting Wyatt has been building for months, so that way it doesn't lose any of that momentum, while it still also gives the crowd a bit of a chance to to cool off. And then we go to the Iron Man match that was 60 minutes. So I originally was not gonna have this party animal segment here, but I threw it in because you need breathing room. A 60 minute match. I mean, that match was chaotic. We needed some sort of a breathing room here. And yeah, it's a YouTube video, so technically you could stop the video there and come back another time. But for the sake of it being an actual show, I felt like adding in this this sort of breathing period. Like, it's only, what, like five minutes? Maybe like eight minutes max, roughly. So it doesn't really take up too much time. Um... But yeah, it gives me a chance to kind of... This was just a fun segment overall to make. It was a very lighthearted sort of thing. It, was, it allowed me to bring in the legends. It really had that WrestleMania moment. And at the same time, people could say, well, like, um, you know, I, ha I had Goldberg get taken out by Kevin Owens. And you're like, oh, why are you making the legends look like crap? Like, you had Michaels lose at Roadblock. You had Triple H lose at Roadblock. You had Sting lose at WrestleMania. You had The Undertaker lose at WrestleMania. Why are you making the legends look like crap, dude? It's because they're not the main focus of the show. So this scene allows me to throw the legends in there 
And I, I, I just like this, to be perfectly honest. I, we've had the search for the party animal going on since the beginning of the 2K17 season. So I thought this was a good way to really bring that to, you know, give it center stage. Uh, because I needed something to, you know, a bit of a cool down segment. And that's that's what this did. It's it's just having, having some fun. I mean, Shawn Michaels breaking out. I mean, that, we have Michaels doing that. We brought it, we were able to bring in Dude Love. You know, The Rock was in there as well. And then, of course, Goldberg. I just like the, the tone shift there. Because we go from The Rock, yeah, he throws a punch. And I also like just being able to throw in a couple quick little jabs like that. Um, in, in any capacity. It just, I know Fondango's a jobber in my series. I'm not trying to hide that. He is a jobber. But I like having fun with my jobbers. Like Heath Slater... Heath Slater, when he was still a jobber, that was just... I, I get too invested in my characters. That's my problem. Is Even even the, the lowly peasants, or peons, the jobbers, even the, even they have personality. Like, I, I can't avoid it. So I had fun doing this segment. We have Fondango, and then bringing in Goldberg, it helps bring the tension back, because there's this... It's like a light-hearted, serious moment, because it's not... When Kevin Owens comes in, you know the fun and games are over. Uh, and you know that things are about to get real. Yet, when Goldberg comes out, like, you know things are getting serious. He's not out here to dance. He's not out for fun and games. But then again, it's still Fondango he's going up against. So you know not to take anything really too seriously. And I do like doing this because I don't think it's any secret that I'm setting up something here between Owens and uh, Goldberg. I'm not sure if the videos about them will have come out yet. Um... But this is definitely going to be uploaded after the WWE draft. So it's no secret that Goldberg is going to SmackDown. This scene with Kevin Owens obviously setting something up there. Um, and yeah, I, because I thought this was also a cool way. Rather than having a hard cutaway like the WrestleMania transition screen that I used to cut to an ad break. It also gave me a chance to just perfectly segue into the next match. Because not only am I setting something up here between Owens and Goldberg in the future, it provides an end to the Party Animal segment because we've gotten Fondango out of here, and then we jump straight into the Kevin Owens-Undertaker match. I'm very proud of this segment. I mean, I know it was one of the least important things on the card, uh, this little Party Animal segment, but I had a lot of fun making it. Um, it wasn't too difficult to record. I actually had to re-record it because I lost the initial file for it. So a bit of a bit of a fun fact there, I suppose. But yeah, let's get back to where we were. Next up was well, I mean, this goes on for a while. We did eventually, once we got down to the home stretch, I had just a standard singles affair between Styles and Orton. This this is part of the tag team mechanics where I really couldn't do much to edit around this. Like we had this super duper close up on Joe throwing Batista out of the ring. And then we cut away to the singles thing. Yeah, I wasn't. This finish wasn't perfect, but this matchup wasn't exactly meant to be a show stealer. Like not every, not every match can be a ten out of ten, because otherwise your whole show is just a five out of ten. Because ten out of ten is the average that you're going for. If that makes any sense, like there's no real sense of rising and falling action. It's just all climax, and that doesn't work. That's not how you tell a story. So this whole show, like really constructing a match card, the whole card is a, is a story. I have a script that I need to write at some point about how to book. Uh, this can hopefully give me, I guess, a little bit of a foundation on what I want to say in that script. I haven't really had the motivation to write uh, the Universe Mode 101 stuff since I made that first one. Uh, but I'm definitely going to be working on that here soon. I'd like to write one this week, maybe have one to release in like April Possibly May, depending on how many projects I have to work on, because I obviously have to edit this. I have to finish WrestleMania, the WWE Draft, and then, of course, my second channel, which I'm trying to really, really launch production on that, because I want that channel to, to gain an audience as well. And WrestleMania obviously has been taking away from that second channel. The second channel, obviously, yeah, that is going to take away some of my workload from this channel. I'm dividing my time between two things. But I have a bit of a reveal that's going to be coming up uh, probably around May, June-ish, 
which um, should hopefully give a bit of an indicator as to where my time is going to be going. I don't want to spoil it yet because I haven't even really discussed it with anyone. Um, but yeah, there's going to be a big reveal for the channel. It's going to make for a very interesting state of the channel video, which is uh, how I'm going to discuss the video. So expect another state of the channel video to come out probably in May, maybe June. But I mean, my first semester of college, or not my first semester, my first year of college ends in May. So that's when I'll be coming back home. So that's when I'll record it because I'll have the time to do it then. So probably sometime in like mid-May, you'll get another state of the channel video, which it's going to be definitely a very important update. But that's all I'm going to say on that for now because I need to straighten everything out and talk to the right people first before I go ahead and reveal it on YouTube. So then we go ahead into the Brock Shinsuke match. Very simple. It's just a straight up singles match. Most of it was one take. Um, I think I did have, I think I did botch a pinfall in here somewhere. I don't know exactly what move it was, but it does gives me, gives, blah, 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 gives me the chance to work with more crowd cutaway, or not crowd cutaways, uh, highlight reel replays. So, yeah. This matchup, yeah, very straightforward, not too much going on, other than just like a couple replays, no real extensive editing here, it's just... Uh, one-on-one -on -one matchup. Not too much to do there. So, yeah, Shinsuke gets the win there. We move into Brian Punk. This match was a blast. For how long I've been building this matchup up, I was definitely worried that it wasn't going to deliver because after a year and a half of in-game build-up, uh, in real life, we've been building to this match since WWE 13. So I had very big shoes to fill. And I think, it, not to really sound arrogant, that's just my my thoughts on the matter, I think I knocked it out of the park. I don't think I could have done any better with this matchup. Um, like I, for, I've been told by some of, um, I've been told by some people that I'm really good at preserving finishers, like keeping the finishers strong. And obviously with WrestleMania being the big event, uh, that's going to be brought down a bit because obviously Rain Cena, we had a couple of kickouts with finishers there. Um, it was, I think other matches had it as well. Owens Taker had some kickouts. Rollins Ambrose had it as well. Certain matches, you you can't really preserve finishers on a big a big scale stage like this. But this matchup, I was very happy with because not once in this matchup did Punk hit the GTS. I think he only even attempted it once. And it was reversed. Brian went for the running knee and missed, but he ended up, that was the move that won the match. What I really liked doing with this show that I haven't really had the chance to do previously was completely go in and edit the move sets. This matchup, I had everything, like, I had their move sets set from the beginning, so I didn't have to worry about cutting in between matches, which is why this one didn't take as much time to record as the Cesaro Ziggler matchup. In fact, I was actually able to record the Party Animals segment that I was talking about earlier. I was able to record that during the same recording because I finished this in probably like an hour. And for the match being, uh, it was about half an hour in length. That's pretty good. I know it's like double the time to actually record all of that, but that's pretty good. There weren't really too many botches to worry about. When I recorded this, it just clicked. And this was one of the first matchups that I recorded. The very first one that I did was Roman Reigns versus John Cena. So you can imagine, I thought that matchup was pretty good. And then at that point, that was me setting the standard for everything else that I'd have to record after that. So that was definitely a fun challenge. Then we moved on to this, which I believe was my second session. If not, I did the Sting Bray Wyatt stuff. Uh, and I think there was another match that might have been recorded along with that. Maybe the women's... No, I don't remember. No, it would have been the Paige-Stephanie match that went with Sting Wyatt. So, that might have been before this. Might have been, but I'm not entirely sure. Either way, this was either the second or third recording. Um, but yeah, this matchup, everything just clicked. There were definitely some, some pinfall botches, which is how I was able to get these early replay shots that I was able to use. But adjusting the movesets was really fun, because I was able to give Punk... I believe the technical name of the move is the reverse 
uh, the reverse Ushiguroshi, which is like Styles Fireman's Carry Neckbreaker, but um, I forget the name of the guy who uses it. It's the guy who Styles was like inspired by to use the move. Uh, I just looked it up on Wikipedia today, and I've forgotten the name because I wasn't really paying too much attention to it. I just kind of wanted. I did that so like. I don't watch main roster WWE, so when somebody left, um, the guy who runs the, uh, the Brennan Plays Universe Mode, rumor, or my rumor mill for, on the Brennan Plays forums, um, he pointed it out to me, because I always just called it the Fireman's Carry Neckbreaker, the move that Styles uses, because I didn't know it had another name, because I don't watch main roster WWE, so then I heard it the other day, when I was watching, uh, Elimination Chamber, before my network uh, my, before my network subscription expired, and I'm not renewing it because I'm not watching WrestleMania. I have no interest in the main roster's product. Goldberg won the Universal title. Oh, I could make a whole rant on that, but that's neither here nor there. So yeah, I think I heard the move pronounced once, so I might not have pronounced it right in the video. I think I said Urshi Goroshi, because that's how it's spelled. Um... At least I think that's how it's spelled. Or it is spelled just Ushi. And I butchered it. Either way, I'm not Japanese. So I try to pronounce it as properly as I can. But for a move that I've only ever... I think I've only ever heard it pronounced once. And it's possible that Mauro Ronaldo... I, I doubt that it that he mispronounces it. But I mean, I don't know. Different accents or whatever. He doesn't really have an accent. I'm just making excuse, excuses at this point. I, I just got it wrong. Um... This was the match where I really decided, okay, I need to start cutting out the pins and the submission attempts. Um, so that's really where I started doing it, and then I went back to some of the other ones for the more the more critical pinfalls, and I would edit those. The thing with this show was that not everything was edited chronologically like this. Like, I think the whole timeline, I had it spread over like 13 hours. Um, none of this was even chronological, because I recorded the Reigns Cena match first, so that was the first one that I edited, if I actually go into my... Hopefully none of this is stuff that I have to hide, because that's going to be interesting for me to fix later on. You can see, here's all my pre-commentary footage stuff. I have two matches that I had rendered out February. February 3rd, February 4th, because those were the first two I recorded, and I edited them because I wanted to work on everything in production. Uh, so I was editing stuff in between the times where I could record stuff. So the first two that I worked on were Punk Brian and Reigns Cena. So this was where... Um, I don't remember where they were in the timeline. Um, but yeah, I had to go back through and edit all of this. So none of this really is in the order that I edited it. Um, this would have been one of the first ones that I did. So that's when I realized, okay, I need to... This is something I should do. I should maintain the submissions, uh, the zoom in on the submissions, and I should zoom in for the, 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 the pin bars so we could keep the immersion there. Other than other than the changing of the move sets and all the all the spots, um, not much really to comment on here. Again, I could be more in depth about this, and actually, like I said, I'm going to be doing a how to edit video at some point as well. Scripting that one though is going to be interesting because I don't know if I'm going to make a video for that or if I'm just going over techniques. I'm, I need to decide on what I'm going to do for that script. Um, so yeah, I guess if you have ideas for that, you can let me know in the comments. No promises that I won't already have written the script by this point, or I might not have written it, because I don't know when I'm going to get the ideas for it. But yeah, I need to figure out what I'm doing there. It's just sometimes it's a bit difficult to get inspired to write pages and pages of stuff. It's not saying that I can't do it. It's just like sometimes I, the ideas just don't come to me. One thing that I really, really enjoyed in this matchup, though, out of all of the spots in this match, my favorite has to be the Pepsi Plunge. I don't know, because I haven't published the video yet. I don't know how anyone reacted to it. Um, but if I was going to live stream this pay-per-view, this would have been the moment. This would have been the moment that would have been great on a live stream. I'd imagine that people are going to really enjoy it. Um, especially, I really love my reaction to it as well, because I just did the commentary for it today, and my voice crack that went with it, because my voice, you can hear it now, over the course of this video, it's been, i it's been leaving me. I'm starting to get hoarse, because I did a ton of screaming. I've already done three hours of commentary between yesterday and today, 
And it's starting to get late today. I did commentary earlier this morning, so I had hours to recuperate from it. But after doing the promo video that I recorded earlier on, which will be uploaded before now, um, doing it all in one session, just because I have the time. And I see, I could be writing scripts right now, but I don't have the ideas. So I figured if I have the time to make videos, and these are videos that I know I wanted to make, I'm just going to record the commentary for them now while I have the time. Anywho, this definitely one of my favorite moments on WrestleMania, the Pepsi Plunge, especially because Brian kicks out of it. Like, I don't know if people were predicting Brian to win. I have kind of a... Well, most people, I think, seem to think that Brian was going to win this matchup. Some people thought Punk. Um, but really, it wasn't It wasn't one of the big-time matchups. Like, really, either man could have won. And it wouldn't really have made a, a huge difference, not like with Rollins and Ambrose or, like, the title matches, where, obviously, huge implications by that. This one is just sort of a, an exhibition match. Um, but yeah, if I had live streamed this pay-per-view, that probably would have been moment of the night, the Pepsi plunge. I feel like people, I feel like people would mark out for that, especially because Brian kicks out of it and then the match continues for another several minutes. This matchup, just everything clicked on all cylinders. I loved it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stick around on it longer than I need to. I feel like I already have, but it was, it was really fun putting this matchup together. I especially enjoyed the fact that I was able to pr protect the GTS and protect the running knee. I feel like that only just added to the matchup because it's different with guys like Cena and Reigns where they're not, you know, they're not technical specialists. But Brian and Punk, they are two of the best athletes in professional wrestling. Uh, at least they were when they were both competing in it. And so, yeah, they need to have diverse movesets. So that is... I had to go all out with that matchup, and I think the result was... Perhaps the match of the year. I don't know. There were a lot of... I think I think I had several matches on this show which could be considered match of the year. But we'll see how the audience reacts and we'll see how the Slammy Awards come about. Anyways, this is the standard effect that I use for Sting's entrance. Because if I keep the full thing in, I'll get hit with a copyright claim and the video will be blocked. That's what happened to my Elimination Chamber pre-show in WWE 2K15. So we don't do that anymore. I throw in this overlay and I cut down the footage because I do not want to deal with that. And just in case, I throw in this effect over Bray Wyatt's because I don't want to deal with the copyright that comes with it. I had issues with Drew McIntyre's entrance video way back in WWE 13. And I do not want that to happen again. I have learned since then. This again, another pretty standard matchup. Just one-on-one. -on -one, most of it done in a single single take. I might have botched a kick out here or there. Nothing really noteworthy out of this matchup. Again, this was sort of to bridge the gap. Oh, my voice is really starting to hurt now. Really starting to bridge the gap uh, between the Iron Man and the Brian Punk match. Because if I jump straight into it, no one has time to breathe. So this matchup was meant to be slower. It also doesn't help I guess I didn't really click with these two for the type of match that I like to produce because I like everything to be sort of the faster paced and to have more of the high spots. But with Sting, if I have him going off the top rope all the time, it loses its luster. Bray Wyatt, he's not a high flyer. He can get to the second rope. That's probably about the limit unless in maybe a super high critical situation he'll go off the top. I don't know. Maybe someday. But yeah, this matchup... There, I mean, Sting doesn't have a very versatile offense. He has very old school moves because, I mean, he's a very old school guy. So there just wasn't, I don't know, this matchup, not one of the standouts, I would say. I mean, for the storyline's sake, I think it was good. I I think I did well with the build up to it. I just don't think the match was ever going to deliver to the standard that I would. It was never going to be a Daniel Bryan versus CM Punk. And that's just that's just a fact. Um, so saying it's a bad match isn't fair because it's a completely different style, but it was never going to be th the big standout of the night, like Brian Punk or the Iron Man or either of the main events was going to be. Then there's this little ad that I kind of just threw together for the second channel. Hopefully WrestleMania, if anybody who found WrestleMania, uh, was anime fans, then they could check that out. Then we have the Iron Man match. This was a blast. Not as much as Punk Brian, because that all came essentially out of one match. I liked making the attires. 
Although, I guess the, the top that Rollins is wearing here, I don't know if the colors are the best. I was thinking, like, a mix of, like, a blood red and, like, a gold as, like, royalty or something, but I think they might kind of clash. It looks kind of like a ke ketchup and mustard thing. I gave it the metallic look to differentiate, make it look more golden and more red, but I don't know if it was perfect. Either way, just trying something different. What I can say with confidence is that I love this attire. It, yes, those are Corey Graves' pants. Dean Ambrose has stolen Corey Graves' wardrobe now that he's retired. But, I mean, with the jacket, the, the little beanie he's wearing, I just love everything about this. Definitely one of my favorite attires I've made over the course of the series. Then what happens, we have we have two things here. This is, well, this is just a screenshot of the thing that I made so I could have a still image of the timer fading in before it actually starts to count down. And then we have just a standard gradient with the a text file that shows, you know, the number of falls in each person. Fairly basic. If I were to do this again in the future, I could try to improve on that, maybe have a graphic designer work on that for me, like I did with the actual WrestleMania graphics. Again, big shout out to Kype GFX. He is amazing. His stuff for WrestleMania was incredible, and I love it. I love him. He is amazing. So this timer, I didn't want to do... I know Sony has a... Sony Vegas has a, a time code effect where I think you just turn like a text file into a countdown timer, but the way that everything is structured... It has, like, I used it in the championship scramble, so if you want to see a visual representation of it. But it does, like, min hours, minutes, seconds, uh, like, frames. It's it's too much information. It's not necessary. That, and I don't think it looks very good, because it's just a black screen. So this way, I could at least add some color behind it. I just went onto YouTube, found a 60-minute countdown timer, and I used that. I threw in the chroma key effect, which I discussed in my uh, Behind the Universe promos video. So if you're interested on what the chroma key effect is, basically you just cut out the black or any single color behind it. And I needed to have this gradient background because otherwise it's white text and it clashes. There needs to be some contrast there. This matchup, mostly just a sequence of one-on-one -on -one shots. Uh, obviously we have a, a few highlight, or not highlight reel, um, replays here and there, because actually I botched, I remember botching the running knee trembler that Ambrose hits early on in this matchup, where I actually took the pin off that move, so that was a bit disheartening, but it gave me some replays to work off right off the bat, so I was happy with that. Then, this goes on for a little while. What I enjoyed was how mid-match we turn from an iron, a standard Iron Man match, where there's disqualification and countouts in effect, that's what people were, were skeptical about, was me choosing the Iron Man stipulation to end it. Some people thought I could have done, like, Last Man Standing, something to make it a bloody war. And I guess they weren't expecting an Iron Man match to necessarily be the best platform for that. But I was a step ahead of you guys. So we have them both get counted out. They head backstage. We lose control. And then, eventually, Triple H says, you know what, no disqualification. It's not Falls Count anywhere, but it's no disqualification, no count out. So, yeah, these guys, if they want to kill each other, go ahead. But they got to bring it back into the ring. So, that goes on for a while. This is obviously a separate match, because I couldn't figure out how to just go straight back there from WrestleMania. I don't think it's even possible. The backstage brawl might only be available for, like, the regular arenas the regular layouts there. Or I think it was just the way that the WrestleMania ramp works. So this is a separate matchup, the backstage brawl. That happens for a a several solid minutes. This, I guess, wasn't the best edit where we cut away. Rollins is running close up on Ambrose, and then out of nowhere, here comes Scott Dawson and Dash Wilder. But it works. Audience can't see it coming, even though I guess the, the crop in would kind of indicate that something's about to happen. Then we bring out Blake and Murphy. They scuffle for a while. That's a couple of separate matches thrown in there. And then, yeah, from that point on, it's basically just Rollins versus, Am or Rollins versus Ambrose. Yes, I was right the first time. This matchup, because it was spread over so many different sessions, I did... I think I recorded, like, three or four things with this. Because some of it, I interspersed... I hate how it does this. 
because now it's showing Coliseum image, even though it's the WrestleMania recording. Way to go, Sony Vegas. And this is from a graphic that I don't even have anymore. I used it just for a throwaway gag in a GM mode video. But anyways, we had several different recordings where I would record the Iron Man match and the ladder match. I did it, um, I might have only done that in one session, actually. But because they were so ev uh, editing intensive, I did have to, I figured work on both of them so that way I can record a little bit. Because I can only remember so many spots, and I'll eventually start to lose track of where I am. So, by doing two matches at once, um, I'm limited in how far I can go. But then, I can also just keep going with the recording to work on the next match. So yeah, this is basically standard fare. With it being over multiple recordings, I did change up the move sets over the course of this matchup. This was not the last time I would do this. Um, just because obviously if we just go Dirty Deeds, Pedigree, Curb Stomp, Dirty Deeds, Pedigree, Curb Stomp, it gets old really fast. And towards the end when we have people kicking out of those, you need other moves. My elbow, wrist, something in my arm just cracked. I'm sure that the mic picked that up. Um, yeah, but yeah, certain moves that I threw into the, like this move I added to Ambrose's arsenal. I thought it just looked more physical definitely worked for this sort of a war that was going on. But no real tricky edits involved in this matchup for the most part. It's basically just make sure that I have the, the bell ring after each fall. Um, I'm able to split up the replays for each different fall. And then just make sure that I throw in the, the well obviously the timer's there, but then just throw in the I can't even think right now. The, the Fall counter, whatever it's called. The little, the, the keep track of the, the doohickey whatchamajig, that thing. But yeah, I don't think I really had like a Pepsi plunge moment in this match. Although, I mean, Ambers did use the burning hammer and Seth Rollins. Oh, actually, no, this was fun. This was a fun callback because I was looking. There are certain OMGs that other people use in matches and they get used all the time, like the, the ring post, big boot. Apron DDT, Spear Through the Barricade. And I wanted this match to feel different, so I didn't want to use those. So I figured, okay, here's an interesting callback. We know Seth Rollins has had history with Rob Van Dam. Van Dam was a part of the Team Ambrose, Team Rollins matchup. He was on Ambrose's side. So I figured, you know what? Let's throw in the callback to RVD. Let's go ahead, throw in that, that barricade leg drop. Thought that was kind of fun. But then, yeah, we had the Burning Hammer thrown in there. And the Vertebreaker, Rollins using the Vertebreaker, Ambrose using the Burning Hammer. I really just think, for this being the, the final war, the last battle between these guys, and then also we have the callback to Survivor Series with the Superplex to the floor. I think Rollins hit in... No, Rollins did not, actually. That was Ziggler I'm thinking of with the elbow drop through the table. But again, it's about saving certain spots for later, uh, making sure that you don't repeat things. At least in terms of like the OMG moments, because if you do them all the time, then they're not, uh, they're not OMG moments. Of course, the exchanging of finishers bound to happen. I did it in the Punk Brian matchup, but for this being 60 minutes, it was bound to happen at some point. One thing that I could not figure out for the life of me was how to counter the curb stomp into the RKO, because I knew that the animation was in the game before. Uh, but I couldn't figure it out, and I saw it wasn't a mid-move counter, so I wasn't entirely sure if I had to give Ambrose the RKO as a finisher. I ultimately decided not to do that, and then just out of nowhere, when I attempted to hit a curb stomp, and I wanted Ambrose to counter it, I just triggered the animation. So, that was fun, because I was actually able to include the spot that I wanted to, I just couldn't find it at first. So that that, that was a fun thing, because I couldn't figure it out for the longest time, how to counter the curb stomp into the RKO. And because I, I switched curb stomps throughout this match, so like, I did the one by the side, which I personally prefer, because I just think it looks smoother, but then there's also the kick to the midsection, run off the ropes, and then hit the curb stomp, which isn't bad either, but I personally prefer the grounded one, but it was the, the shot to the midsection one that I had to, uh, the standing up one, the vertical curb stomp that I had to I had to use in order to get that animation. But yeah, most of this, we bring in the chair. I also had to be careful with blood, because for a while I had forgotten that I wanted this matchup to be bloody. 
Uh, but at the same time, if I had had Ambrose start bleeding early on in the match, that blood would have had to carry over for the rest of the match. So before I did any of the action, I would have had to bust Ambrose open each time. And that would be very time-consuming, very annoying. Also, because you inflict all that damage, it's much more difficult to kick out of pins. Because you have to inflict so much damage before you can actually make your opponent bleed. So around, you know, this this eight-minute mark, we finally got Ambrose to, to bleed, finally busted him open. And from that point, it was a lot easier to keep track of. Um, obviously, in every other cut following that, I had to make sure that Ambrose bled, so that way it maintained consistency. So that I did botch a few pinfalls because of that, because you have to take so much damage in order to make your opponent bleed. But we did manage to get it together. Here it is. There's that curb stomp spot. I was like, well, okay. Uh, let's say he goes for the curb stomp. I want to counter it anyway. And then this just happened. So I was happy about that, because that was a spot I wanted to hit anyway. And then, of course, I knew that I had, like... When I did the final Iron Man recording, I think I had maybe about 10 minutes left. And if you even ask uh, someone like Heel Diggy or Murphs, um, I was talking to them about it, and I was like, shoot, I have... I think I have, like, 20 minutes left to fill, and I have, like, 10 minutes worth of ideas. Anybody got any ideas? Uh, but then I eventually came up with something... And I ended up going overtime. This matchup was not initially supposed to go overtime. Um, obviously, the Roman Reigns thing was supposed to happen. I wanted Reigns to make a cameo in this because of the post-match thing. So I figured, why not have Rollins try to just, you know, hightail it for the match? Just leave it at a draw. But that doesn't happen. Reigns comes out, shuts him down. This matchup wasn't supposed to go overtime. It was going to end with the same finish, the roll-up. Uh, that was that was meant to be the end because it's supposed to feel like Rollins just robbed you of you know the great match because here I mean you, he hits the vertebraker there's like 20 seconds left but now Ambrose kicks out it's supposed to feel I wanted it to feel like Rollins stole the victory and I ended up just running out of time so I said okay we're in overtime I guess that's just happening now so yeah we had the 60 minute Iron Man match and I even went beyond it was not the plan. But when you're working against the clock, it's very difficult to get everything the way you want it. I learned that in the championship scramble. And this one, I at least had a bit more room to maneuver because it didn't just cap off at the 60 minutes because it was a it was a tie. So I did at least, I was able to go overtime there. But yeah, nothing, nothing else really to bring up here. Separate shot. Obviously in this cut, I had to have Reigns bust Ambrose open before I did all of this. And then, of course, Ambrose lays out Roman Reigns. What does the future hold for Dean Ambrose and Roman Reigns? Well, I guess you're going to have to find out later on. Then here's the Party Animal segment. We already covered that. Clean transition into the Kevin Owens Undertaker matchup. This matchup, again, not very noteworthy. We obviously have Kevin Owens laying out Goldberg beforehand. And this is just a standard singles matchup. When I first... Part of the recording that I lost where I did the Party Animal segment was of this match. And I just could, I couldn't get them to click. I just couldn't get into a rhythm with Undertaker and Owens. Fortunately, the footage corrupted, so I couldn't use it anyway. And I had to... Well, that's an ironic statement. Fortunately, the footage corrupted. Yeah, I'm sure that's what every video editor would say. Um, but yeah, it just wasn't a good outcome the first time around. So I was able to... That and I couldn't figure out how to do the old school... Turns out it's a strike and not a grapple. I did not know this, so I was like, oh, I have to set it to his signature in order to use it. Not even thinking that it could be a strike. So that was fun for me, but nothing really noteworthy out of this matchup. It's just standard singles fair. I knew that I, I knew how I wanted the finish to go. Everything else was just sort of improv. And that's how we get the matchup that we get here. And there was no interference in this to worry about. So it really was just a standard one-on-one -on -one matchup. No real issues that wouldn't occur in other matches. Botched kickouts, uh, trying to piece footage together, all that good stuff. And I'm just going through here just to double check, make sure there wasn't any interesting edit that I'm missing. Uh, but no, there wasn't really. And I don't think there was... There wasn't a... I think maybe the counter to the tombstone from Owens might have been like the, the equivalent of the... I mean, I like this spot. I just like 
the tombstone counters. If I could have, I would have had Owens counter Undertaker's tombstone, but it just did not end up working into the matchup. So I figured, you know what, let's just not worry about it. We got one tombstone counter into another tombstone. That's good enough for me. But I don't think this matchup really had a Pepsi plunge moment. Like, yeah, we had the apron powerbomb, but that's that's different. That's not like a mark out. Holy crap. He just used this move. It was really just a, oh, crap. He just destroyed The Undertaker. He That man is dead. And yeah, that was that matchup. Then we move on to the main event. And this one, well, actually, yeah, there was this little part. So I already mentioned about Mr. Big Show Off. He gave me this clip because otherwise it would have been the World Heavyweight title and that would not fly. And I needed that clip because I needed Taker to be in the ring for Bray Wyatt. So what's going to happen with The Undertaker and Bray Wyatt? Find out in the future. Then that leads us to the main event. And I knew going into this, I had a chip on my shoulder because this matchup did not have the best buildup on the card. I am aware of that because, I mean, uh, we had Rollins Ambrose has been building for like nine, ten months. We have Brian Punk been building for over a year and a half. I mean, heck, even the Evolution matchup has Orton Joe has been in the works since Survivor Series. This matchup really only really only came to fruition at the earliest, the Royal Rumble, when Cesaro won the thing. And then, of course, Dolph Ziggler um, defeated... Or obviously, Dolph Ziggler being the guy Cesaro would face at uh, WrestleMania. That was the guy... I had always planned that it was going to be Cesaro versus Ziggler. So if anyone was wondering, well, why didn't you go with Cesaro versus Kevin Owens? Surely that was the plan. No, it really wasn't. Um, I always was planning on doing Owens versus Taker, Admittedly, I could have booked it better. Um, I guess I just don't really know how to book The Undertaker, like, to have him long-term. Because, like, with the Sting-Taker match, wasn't really that good. Now, granted, I wasn't... I wasn't very good at booking back then. I didn't have the understanding that I have now. But, you know, I had Undertaker full-time, and the storylines weren't that great. But then, like, I haven't booked The Undertaker since the WWE 2K15 WrestleMania, so trying to get into his style. I think I worked a match pretty well with him, but booking him as the challenger for the title, it was kind of difficult because I, I didn't really have anyone strong enough built up to fight. Like, the only other two people who maybe could have challenged were Brian or Punk. Well, I guess technically four because it could have been Reigns or Cena, but, I mean, we've seen Kevin Owens versus Roman Reigns before, and... John Cena versus Kevin Owens. They're both heels. Does that really make much sense? No, I'm really I'm really happy with how the other rivalries turned out. This one might have been, I guess, kind of weak for a main event, but I needed this match to happen because Kevin Owens, well, you saw what he did to The Undertaker. You heard what he said at the Slammy Awards. He's out to end careers. This matchup was very important. Needed to happen. It could not have been anybody else. So that's why that's why that matchup happened. Booking could have been better, but realistically, I don't see anybody else facing Kevin Owens for the title at WrestleMania. Not even Cesaro, because that just wasn't the match that I wanted to go for. The whole time, my plan was Cesaro versus Dolph Ziggler, and I think the matchup, because I had it planned for so long, I think the matchup really turned out well. If it weren't for Brian versus Punk, and potentially the Iron Man match, I know people... My thing with these matches where I'm going in and doing all these heavy edits, I'm never going to consider them to be match of the year. The Iron Man one is a bit of an exception because it was mostly singles action, so I could see it. But because I myself am not getting immersed in the action while recording it, I'm never going to have that feeling like, oh yeah, this was match of the year. That's why the Survivor Series tag team matchup, when that won match of the year... Like, I almost didn't even consider putting it in because I didn't think it should be. Even though I did all this work into it, I'm not saying that it's a bad match, that it's not deserving of being match of the year. I just did not get that feeling while recording it because of my experience with recording it. This one and the Brian Punk one, I feel like were both strong matches that I actually got to experience firsthand as I was recording the thing. So if it wasn't for Brian Punk, I would say this would be my favorite match of the night. Um, I thought there were there were plenty of spots in this matchup that I really liked. Obviously, Dolph Ziggler working with a neck injury was fun. I did have to change up the move sets here during the match. 
Obviously, Cesaro, he hits the neutralizer at one point, and that's not the move that he finishes the match with. So I did have to change that. Cesaro, I think I might have changed his signature a couple times. We had, obviously, the, the gut wrench suplex combination, which I think is actually what I'm on right now. I decided to throw in the tiger faint kick. Only the problem with that was uh, the animation is broken. Because, like, he hits this hurricanrana, right? And then... This one, I'm actually going to show you what happens. So he hits this Hurricanrana, and then there's this weird cut. And it looks kind of weird. Why did I do that? Well, he just stops. The animation stops. What the hell? That's not what it used to do. You used to throw him into the ropes and go. That doesn't happen here. He just stops dead in his tracks. What the hell, 2K? What are you doing to me? Man, I really should not. I'm amazed that I was able to hit that high pitch with how wrecked my voice is right now. So yeah, I had to splice together two different uh, two different Tiger Faint kicks. One with the actual Hurricanrana animation. Then I had to throw Ziggler down onto this rope and then hit the signature again and it actually go through. So I had to split, it, split that up. And I know Cesaro, Cesaro uses the Tiger Faint kick. I might try to throw it into his arsenal again, but if the animation... Always does that. It could have just been a one-time goof, but that really concerns me because if that always happens, he's not using the Tiger Faint kick. Unless 2K fixes the animation, and when they add it to his moveset proper in WWE 2K18, well then, by that point, they'll probably have it. But like a lot of these moves that I use, I added to Cesaro's moveset. Like, he didn't originally have this move, the Tiger Faint kick, he used that one power bomb, the deadlift. He did not have that. Uh, moves like, I think, the Air Raid Siren. Is that what it's called? The move where he, like, rolls through and, like, uh, your opponent's on the ground. He rolls into that, like, Alabama slam position and delivers a neck breaker. Ziggler's move said I had to alter as well. Um, obviously, I threw in the spear just for that sort of callback to his rivalry with Edge. We had, like, the midair super kick. A lot of spots in this matchup I did really like. The deadlift gut wrench suplex was a fun one. We had, uh, I don't think I used the sharpshooter in this matchup, actually. That was the signature I had to get rid of, and I just didn't really see a point, uh, a point where I could have thrown it in there. Like, this move I added in, that was custom. Um, obviously we used, well, here it is. Here's the move I was talking about, where you, or the, like, the crash something. It's like, I want to say, like, air raid crash neckbreaker is what the animation is called, but... It's something, I have some of those words right, and I probably have some of those wrong. But yeah, I the I think the fun part for me was molding Cesaro's arsenal around that neck injury. Because that was obviously the story I wanted to work throughout this matchup. One of my favorite moments in this match, like if there was a Pepsi plunge moment in this matchup, it would have been that modified, uh, the modified one-winged angel. That was a spot that I was really looking forward to using in this matchup. I mean, there was a lot of false finishes that I think really worked. And if you want to talk about protecting finishers, I think I did a pretty good job. I mean, obviously, yeah, there were kickouts of basically every finisher in this match. We had the super kick get kicked out of, the Swiss death, the neutralizer, the zigzag got kicked out of. But when you start getting into the realm of, like, two kickouts, then that's when you're over the top. I think one kickout is fine as long as... Uh, well, like, I didn't even go back to those finishers, so it wasn't like Ziggler kicks out of a neutralizer and Cesaro hits him with another neutralizer, and that's the end. Not to say that that's a bad finish, but I feel like I really did earn the kickouts for those finishers. We had moves like that Dude Buster. Um, I don't think there was really anything else to point out other than, like I said, the, the, big, uh, the big moment with the... The modified one-winged angel. That was a really fun, really fun move to use. I mean, there are other moves, like the Northern Light Suplex Brain Buster combo. That was a bit of a callback to his WWE 2K15 Open Challenge days when I added that to his arsenal. So that was fun to bring that back. But yeah, I think that's basically all the noteworthy points in this matchup. Obviously, like, I tried to look for as many variations of the European uppercut as possible. The uppercut to the back of the head, the military press into the European uppercut. That was a move I had to add to his arsenal. I actually don't even know, like, why that animation is in the game if it's not in Cesaro's arsenal, but maybe somebody else uses it. 
Then, of course, we had Ziggler's signature elbow through the announce table. He did the same thing at Survivor Series, so that was a bit of a callback. But the thing with this one was, like, you, unlike with the Iron Man match, what I liked about this and the punk Brian matchup specifically, when I talk about the two that I thought were, like, matches of the night, um, was the fact that there was really no time limit, so you never knew when this was going to end, unless you went by the timestamps, of course. But it was basically one fall to the finish. So even like this, the callback to Ryback shell-shocked. Because obviously that was the move that beat Ziggler at SummerSlam when Ziggler first got put on the shelf with his neck injury when he lost his world title to Ryback. But like, it's all about just going for that one fall to the finish. And I feel like that really does stretch out the drama and makes it makes the tension much more palpable. But ultimately, I think this was my favorite moment of the match when we... I could have done the one-winged angel proper, but I decided not to. Uh, part of that was because I didn't realize that the proper one-winged angel was in the game. I overlooked it, and this was the first one that I found, so that's what I went with. I did find it later on when I was going back through to edit move sets, but I ultimately decided with this one because I just felt as though that looked... I don't know. Because, like, I don't know how I feel about using foreign finishers... or Not, not foreign finishers, but people who aren't in... The WWE, I don't necessarily want to sully their moves because what if they eventually get brought into the WWE? Um, like Kenny Omega, I don't really see that happening. He doesn't really seem like a WWE guy to me. Though, to be fair, my only experience with Kenny Omega is his match with Okada at Wrestle Kingdom 11, was it? I honestly don't know. I don't keep enough track of New Japan, and I really should because... That match was incredible. New Japan usually has really, really good stuff, especially the Wrestle Kingdom shows. I need to follow them more because WWE has completely lost me. But anyways, I decided to just go with this one because, yeah, it's a little less impact, like in terms of vertical height, but it's still a lot of damage done to the neck. I felt like it worked. Other than that, nothing really new here added to the arsenals. We had the kick out of the zigzag, Builds up the tension, and then finally, well, yeah, the Swiss death in midair. Followed through. This was always going to be the finish. I had this finish planned out months in advance. The moment that this animation was put in the game, I knew this was going to be the finish. Ziggler's neck injury and Cesaro's finisher being the neutralizer. Just call it a neutralizer, pi bleh, bleh, a neutralizer pile driver, and boom. That's the finish. And yeah, that was WrestleMania. That was Behind the Universe. This is a very long video. I don't know. Maybe I'll try to edit this down into parts, although I don't really... No, I'm not going to do that, because if I was going to do that, I would have focused more on each, you know, because I thought maybe I would do a part for Tag Team Match, part for the Intercontinental, part for Iron Man, because those were the main three. But I usually like to just sort of, sort of breeze through... What the heck? I got a weird pop-up. Oh, yeah. That's why I, I, that's why I've been listening to this whole time. Hoobah stank. Yeah, that's why I've been listening to the whole time during this recording. But, yeah, that is it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. This one was longer than the Royal Rumble video, but I felt like my thoughts were at least more compact than they were in the last one. So, hopefully, you enjoyed it. Hopefully, you like these behind-the-scenes looks. I didn't do one for Roadblock I doubt that I'm going to do one for Extreme Rolls, although, hmm, I don't know, maybe. There might be a couple matches, or maybe just one match in particular on, on that card that might be worth taking a look at, although most of it, like, I don't know. It all depends what you guys want to see. Do you like seeing videos like this where I'm just kind of talking over the footage, just sort of breezing through the sort of edits that I had to make? Because if that's the case, I guess I could... But if pay-per-views don't have anything out of the ordinary, then I'm not going to bother going back to uh, look over it. So, like, if I did just, like, a regular pay-per-view with regular matches, like, even, like, if I did, I don't know, like, a tables match, that's still pretty generic in terms of editing that goes into it. The ladder match was different. Tag match was different because those were essentially constructed from scratch. And the same with the Iron Man matchup. So editing intensive matchups like that I might go over. But even just like a two out of three falls match, I don't really see the point in delving into that because it's not very complex. It's just go to one fall, start another match, go to another fall. If you need the third fall, start a third match, another fall, and that's it. But yeah, I think that's enough for me. My voice hurts. 
I need to stop talking so I can heal up for the rest of these WrestleMania commentaries, and then I can get that video done, although it's already going to be out by the time this video goes up. So, yeah, that's going to be it for this video. I'm going to stop rambling. Thank you all for watching, and be sure to catch me in the next one. So until then, keep on YouTubing.